This is section 27 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain, section 27. Territorial Enterprise, February 1866, part 2. Territorial Enterprise, February 1866. Funny. Chief Burke's Star Chamber Board of Police Commissioners is the funniest institution extant, and the way he conducts it is the funniest theatrical exhibition in San Francisco. Now, to see the chief fly around and snatch up accuser and accused before the commission when any policeman is charged with misconduct in the public prints, you would imagine that fearful commission was really going to raise the very devil. But it is all humbug, display, fuss, and feathers. The chief brings his policeman out as sinless as an angel, unless the testimony be heavy enough and strong enough almost to hang an ordinary culprit, in which case a penalty of four or five days' suspension is awarded. Wouldn't you call that legislature steeped in stupidity which appointed a father to try his own son for crimes against the state? Of course. And knowing that the father must share the disgrace if the son is found guilty, would you ever expect a conviction? certainly not. And would you expect the father's blind partiality for his own offspring to weigh heavily against evidence given against that son? Assuredly you would. Well, this police commission is a milder form of that same principle. Chief Burke makes all these policemen, by appointment, breeds them, and feels something of apparent solicitude for them, and yet if any charge is brought against them, he is the judge before whom they are tried. Isn't it perfectly absurd? I think so. It takes all three of those commissioners to convict. The verdict must be unanimous. Therefore, since every conviction of one of the chief's offspring must in the nature of things be a sort of reflection upon himself, you cannot be surprised to know that police officers are very seldom convicted before the police commissioners. Though the man's sins were blacker than night, the chief can always prevent conviction by simply withholding his consent. And this extraordinary power works both ways, too. See how simple and easy a matter it was for the chief to say to a political obstruction in his path, "'You are dismissed, Macmillan. I know of nothing to your discredit as an officer, but you are an aspirant of my position, and I won't keep a stick to break my own back with.' He simply said, "'Go!' and he had to shove. If he had been one of the chief's pets, he might have committed a thousand rascalities, but the powerful commission would have shielded and saved him every time. Nay, more. It would have made a tremendous hubbub, and a showy and noisy pretense of trying him, and then brought him out blameless, and shown him to be an abused and persecuted innocent, and entitled to the public commiseration. Why, the other day, in one of the commission trials, where a newspaper editor was summoned as a prosecutor, they detailed a substitute for the real delinquent, and tried him. There may be more joke than anything else about that statement, but I heard it told anyhow, and then it is plausible. It is just characteristic of star-chamber tactics. You ought to see how it makes the chief wince for anyone to say a word against a policeman. They are his offspring, and he feels all a father's sensitiveness to remarks affecting their good name. It is natural that he should, and it is wrong to do violence to this purely human trait by making him swear that he will impartially try them for their crimes, when the thing is perfectly impossible. He cannot be impartial. Is it human nature to judge with strict impartiality his own friends, his own dependent, his own offspring? But what I mean to speak of, if I ever get through with these preliminary remarks, is the fact that the flag yesterday said one thing severe about the police, and right away the reporter was summoned to stand before that terrible tribunal, the police commissioners, and prove his charges. Poor innocent! Why, he never can prove anything. They will come Iowa justice on him, and he will swear he saw the prisoner do so and so, and the chief will say, Captain Baker, send up thirty-five policemen to swear that they didn't see this thing done. They always manage to have the bulk of testimony on their side anyhow. If Pontius Pilate was on the police, he could crucify the Savior again with perfect impunity. But he would have to let Barabbas and that other policeman alone, who were crucified along with him, formerly. 
there is a bill in the hands of a san francisco legislator which proposes to put the police appointing power in the hands of the mayor the district attorney and the city and county attorney and the trial of policemen and power to punish or dismiss them in the hands of the county and police court prosecuting attorney this would leave chief burke nothing to do but attend to his own legitimate business of keeping the police department up to their work all the time and is just the kind of bill that ought to pass it would reduce the chief from autocrat of san francisco with absolute power to the simple rank of chief of police with no power to meddle in outside affairs or do anything but mind his own particular business he told me not more than a week ago that such an arrangement would exactly suit him now we shall see if it suits him don't you dare send any log-rolling wire-pulling squads of policemen to sacramento mr burke territorial enterprise february eighteen sixty six spiritual insanity i together with the bulletin have watched with deep concern the distress being wrought in our midst by spiritualism during the past week or two i like the bulletin have done all i could to crush out the destroyer i have published full reports of the seances of the so-called friends of progress and the bulletin has left out three columns of printed paragraphs pasted together by its new york correspondent to make room for a report of the spiritualist laura cuppy's lecture and i have followed in the bulletin's wake and shouted every few days another victim of the wretched delusion called spiritualism and like that paper have stated the number of persons it took to hold him and where his mother resided in some instances which have come under my notice these symptoms are peculiarly sad how touching it was on monday evening in the board of supervisors a body which should be a concentration of the wisdom and intellect of the city to see supervisor mccoppin bereft of his accustomed sprightliness and subdued subjugated by spiritualism rise in his place and with bowed head and stooping body and frightened eyes peering from under overhanging brows ejaculate in sepulchral tones fee for fum great heavens to hear him say that and then sit down with the air of a man who has settled a mooted question forever and done the work in a solid substantial manner and it touched me to the very heart to see the mayor of the city a man of commanding presence and solemn demeanor get up and repeat the following as if it were part of a litany three blind mice see how they run the farmer's wife she cut off their tails with the carving knife see how they run he then sat down and leaned his face in his hands and dr rowell got up and said spiritual department paid spiritual department when i was a republican i poisoned rebels now i am a democrat i poison republicans woe 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 unto the traducers of the new light woe 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 to the enemies of the new light woe 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 unto them that hear the cuppy and the foy and the ministering spirits that fan us with invisible wings as they sweep by and whisper eternal truths in our ears woe 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 ha woe ha woe ha buck you duke said mr ashbury impressively mr mccoppin counting on his fingers one airy o oh, airy ickery and phyllisy fallalassy nicholas john queevy quavy english navy stinklum stanklum buck alas my poor poor country mr schrader said with deep feeling but without gesticulation or straining after effect let dogs delight to bark and bite for tis their nature thus your little hands were never made to tear out each other's eyes with my eyes filled with tears to see this body of really able men driveling in this foolish way and as i walked sadly out i said this is more spiritualism the bulletin and i will soon have to record the departure of the board of supervisors for stockton poor creatures to have kept out of the asylum on one pretext or another so long and then to fall at last through so weak a thing as spiritualism reprinted in the golden era february eighteenth eighteen sixty six territorial enterprise february eighteen sixty six the signal corps 
saw something the other night which surprised me more than my late investigation of spiritualism it was some examples of the methods of the united states signal corps to telegraph information from point to point on the battlefields of the rebellion the signal corps mediums were colonel wicker of the russian telegraph expedition and mr jerome secretary of mr conway of the same both of whom were distinguished officers of the signal corps throughout the war besides these two gentlemen there were only two other members of the corps on the coast in the late war a signal party was always stationed on the highest available point on the battlefield and by waving flags they could telegraph any desired messages word for word to other signal stations ten miles off at night when torches were used these messages have been read forty miles away with a powerful glass the flag or torch is waved right left up and down and each movement represents a letter of the alphabet i suppose inasmuch as any villainous combination of letters and syllables you can get up can be readily telegraphed in this way with a good deal of expedition these gentlemen i speak of sent messages the other night with walking sticks with their hands their fingers their eyes and even their mustaches it is a little too deep for me one sat on one side of a large room and the other at the opposite side i wrote a long sentence and gave it to jerome he made a few rapid passes with his right arm like a crazy orchestra leader and colonel wicker called off the sentence word for word i confess that i suspected there was collusion there so i whispered my next telegram to jerome the passes were made as before and colonel wicker read them without a balk i selected from a book a sentence which was full of uncommon unpronounceable foreign words pointed it out to colonel wicker and he telegraphed it across to jerome without a blunder then i gave jerome another telegram he placed two fingers on his knees and raised up one and then the other for a while and the colonel read the message i furnished the latter with the following written telegram general jackson was wounded at first fire he went through with a series of elaborate winks with his eyes and that other signal sharp repeated the sentence correctly i wrote thirteen additional cases of cholera reported this morning the accomplished colonel telegraphed it to his confederate by simply stroking his mustache there must be a horrible imposition about this thing somewhere but i cannot get at it they say that when they are in lecture rooms and parlors whence they are not close enough to speak to each other they telegraph their comment on the company with their fingers on their mustaches or by gently refreshing themselves with a fan the signal corps was one of the most important arms of the military service in the late war it saved many a battle to the union that must otherwise have been lost yet many of the officers of the army did not believe in its efficiency regarded it as an ornamental innovation and bore it strong ill-will at the battle of winchester the officer in command after general shields was wounded had pressing need of reinforcements the reserve were in full view six miles away the acting general asked a signal officer if he could order up a brigade he said he could then do it said the general but said he to make everything sure i will dispatch an orderly for the reinforcements the signal officer set his flags waving and telegraphed send up a brigade on the double quick before the orderly was a hundred yards off the anxious general gazing through his field glass saw a brigade wheel into the plain peel their coats and knapsacks off and throw them down and come swooping across on the double quick by god here they come send back the orderly said the general but i didn't think it could be done reprinted in the golden era february eighteenth eighteen sixty six territorial enterprise february twenty fifth through twenty eighth eighteen sixty six this column has been partially reconstructed from the sketches that were later reprinted in the first edition of the celebrated jumping frog of calaveras county and other sketches from our resident correspondent san francisco february twenty third voyage of the ajax the steamer ajax returned from her pioneer trip to honolulu yesterday about noon bringing forty or fifty passengers and a large quantity of freight she was fourteen days and four hours going down and between eleven and twelve days coming back her crowd of invited guests had a delightful time at honolulu visiting citizens and planters dining out 
driving here and there, attending parties, and prospecting all localities of interest. The people neglected no opportunity of making the visit an agreeable one to their guests, and even His Majesty the King gave them a royal feast. I was talking to one of the voyagers a while ago, and he said that in most respects, in nearly all respects, in fact, the trip was a remarkably pleasant one, but, said he, and here he slowly shook his head and sighed as one who recalls a sorrowful reminiscence, I copper the down trip. From what I can learn of the experiences of that stormy passage, I am satisfied that they all copper that portion of the excursion. The ship left San Francisco in the rain, and for twelve days the excursionists heaved and tossed in the midst of a terrific tempest. The first news that came back here said that the passengers on the Ajax had spent most of the down trip on their knees in prayer. Today their friends greeted them with a hearty handshake, and then felt their knees to see if they were calloused. I refer only to the gentlemen travelers, of course. The storm tore her light spars and rigging all to shreds and splinters, upset all furniture that could be upset, and spilled passengers around, and knocked them hither and thither with a perfect looseness. For forty-eight hours no table could be set, and everybody had to eat as best they might under the circumstances. Most of the party went hungry, though, and attended to their praying. But there was one set of seven-up players who nailed a card-table to the floor, and stuck to their game through thick and thin. Captain Fretz, of the Bank of California, a man of great coolness and presence of mind, was of this party. One night the storm suddenly culminated in a climax of unparalleled fury. The vessel went down on her beam-ends, and everything let go with a crash. Passengers, tables, cards, bottles, everything came clattering to the floor in a chaos of disorder and confusion. In a moment, Fifty sore, distressed, and pleading voices ejaculated, O oh God, help us in our extremity! And one voice rang out clear and sharp above the plaintive chorus, and said, Remember, boys, I played the tray for low. It was one of the gentlemen I have mentioned who spoke, and the remark showed good presence of mind and an eye to business. Louis Leland, of the Occidental, was a passenger. There were some savage grizzly bears chained in cages on deck. One night, in the midst of a hurricane, which was accompanied by rain and thunder and lightning, Mr. Leyland came up on his way to bed, just as he stepped into the pitchy darkness of the deck and reeled to the still more pitchy motion of the vessel, bad, the captain sang out hoarsely through his speaking trumpet, "'Bear a hand aft there!' The words were sadly marred and jumbled by the roaring wind. Mr. Leyland thought the captain said, the bears are after you there, and he let go all holts and went down into his boots. He murmured, I knew how it was going to be. I just knew it from the start. I said all along that those bears would get loose some time, and now I'll be the first man that they'll snatch. Captain, captain, can't hear me storm roars so. Oh, God, what a fate. I have avoided wild beasts all my life, and now to be eaten by a grizzly bear in the middle of the ocean a thousand miles from land. "'Captain! Oh, Captain! Bless my soul, there's one of them. I've got to cut and run.' And he did cut and run, and smashed through the first stateroom he came to. A gentleman and his wife were in it. The gentleman exclaimed, "'Who's that?' The refugee gasped out, "'Oh, great Scotland! Those bears are loose, and just raising merry hell all over the ship!' And sank down exhausted. The gentleman sprang out of bed and locked the door and prepared for a siege. After a while no assault being made, a reconnaissance was made from the window, and a vivid flash of lightning revealed a clear deck. Mr. Leyland then made a dart for his own stateroom, gained it, locked himself in, and felt that his body's salvation was accomplished, and by little less than a miracle. The next day the subject of this memoir, though still very feeble and nervous, had the hardihood to make a joke upon his adventure. He said that, when he found himself in so tight a place, as he thought, he didn't bear it with much fortitude, and when he found himself safe at last in his stateroom, he regarded it as the barest escape he had ever had in his life. He then went to bed, and did not get up again for nine days. This unquestionably bad joke cast a gloom over the whole ship's company, and no effort was sufficient to restore their wonted cheerfulness until the vessel reached her port. 
and other scenes erased it from their memories. The Ajax is advertised to sail for Honolulu again on the 1st of March. PLEASING INCIDENT The splendid band of the old U.S. Second Artillery, so long under the late General de Russi, when he was at the head of the Engineer Corps of the United States and stationed at Fortress Monroe, kindly cherishing the memory of their beloved old commander, went out to South Park last night, after the ceremonies and festivities of Washington's birthday were over, and serenaded Mrs. de Russi and her family. It was a graceful and touching tribute, and showed how well the lads esteemed the old soldier who was always so proud of them. No music could have been imbued with more tender expression than they breathed into their first piece. Should auld acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? There is moving pathos in speech, and eloquence sways the feelings with a mighty power, but music goes straight to the heart after all. The first thing the second artillery did when they landed here from the east a month or two before the old general died was to come out here with their band and serenade him. He was in tolerable health then, and sat up in his parlor in uniform and listened to their martial music, the proudest man in San Francisco. Such marks of regard from his boys always touched him and gratified him. OFF FOR THE SNOW BELT Colonel Conway and his junior officers and assistants leave today in the steamer Active to resume operations in British Columbia on his division of the Russian Telegraph Expedition. He will take a vast amount of wire and telegraph traps of various kinds. Remainder of this passage is missing. A NEW BIOGRAPHY OF WASHINGTON This day, many years ago precisely, George Washington was born. How full of significance the thought! especially to those among us who have had a similar experience, though subsequently, and still more especially to the young, who should take him for a model and faithfully try to be like him, undeterred by the frequency with which the same thing has been attempted by American youths before them, and not satisfactorily accomplished. George Washington was the youngest of nine children, eight of whom were the offspring of his uncle and his aunt. As a boy, he gave no promise of the greatness he was one day to achieve. He was ignorant of the commonest accomplishments of youth. He could not even lie. But then he never had any of those precious advantages which are within the reach of the humblest of the boys of the present day. Any boy can lie now. I could lie before I could stand. Yet this sort of sprightliness was so uncommon in our family that little notice was taken of it. Young George appears to have had no sagacity whatever. It is related of him that he once chopped down his father's favorite cherry-tree, and then didn't know enough to keep dark about it. He came near going to sea once, as a midshipman, but when his mother represented to him that he must necessarily be absent when he was away from home, and that this must continue to be the case until he got back, the sad truth struck him so forcibly that he ordered his trunk ashore and quietly but firmly refused to serve in the navy and fight the battles of his king so long as the effect of it would be to discommode his mother. The great rule of his life was that procrastination was the thief of time, and that we should always do unto others. This is the golden rule. Therefore he would never discommode his mother. Young George Washington was actuated in all things, by the highest and purest principles of morality, justice, and right. He was a model in every way worthy of the emulation of youth. Young George was always prompt and faithful in the discharge of every duty. It has been said of him, by the historian, that he was always on hand, like a thousand of brick. And well deserved was this noble compliment. The aggregate of the building material specified might have been largely increased, might have been doubled, even, without doing full justice to these high qualities in the subject of this sketch. Indeed, it would hardly be possible to express in bricks the exceeding promptness and fidelity of young George Washington. He was a soul whose manifold excellencies were beyond the ken and computation of mathematics, and bricks are, at the least, but an inadequate vehicle for the conveyance of a comprehension of the moral sublimity of a nature so pure as his. Young George W. was a surveyor in early life, a surveyor of an inland port, a sort of county surveyor, and under a commission from Governor Dinwiddie. 
he set out to survey his way four hundred miles through a trackless forest infested with indians to procure the liberation of some english prisoners the historian says the indians were the most depraved of their species and did nothing but lay for white men whom they killed for the sake of robbing them considering that white men only traveled through their country at the rate of one a year they were probably unable to do what might be termed a land office business in their line they did not rob young g w one savage made the attempt but failed he fired at the subject of this sketch from behind a tree but the subject of this sketch immediately snaked him out from behind the tree and took him prisoner the long journey failed of success the french would not give up the prisoners and wash went sadly back home again a regiment was raised to go and make a rescue and he took command of it he caught the french out in the rain and tackled them with great intrepidity he defeated them in ten minutes and their commander handed in his checks this was the battle of great meadows after this a good while george washington became commander-in-chief of the american armies and had an exceedingly dusty time of it all through the revolution but every now and then he turned a jack from the bottom and surprised the enemy he kept up his lick for seven long years and hazed the british from harrisburg to halifax and america was free he served two terms as president and would have been president yet if he had lived even so did the people honor the father of his country let the youth of america take his incomparable character for a model and try it one jolt anyhow success is possible let them remember that success is possible though there are chances against it i could continue this biography with profit to the rising generation but i shall have to drop the subject at present because of other matters which must be attended to territorial enterprise february eighteen sixty six letter from sacramento possibly written or published on february twenty fifth eighteen sixty six i arrived in the city of saloons this morning at three o'clock in company with several other disreputable characters on board the good steamer antelope captain pool commander i know i am departing from usage in calling sacramento the city of saloons instead of the city of the plains but i have my justification i have not found any plains here yet but i have been in most of the saloons and there are a good many of them you can shut your eyes and march into the first door you come to and call for a drink and the chances are that you will get it and in a good many instances after you have assuaged your thirst you can lay down a twenty and remark that you copper the ace and you will find that facilities for coppering the ace are right there in the back room in addition to the saloons there are quite a number of mercantile houses and private dwellings they have already got one capital here and will have another when they get it done they will have fine dedicatory ceremonies when they get it done but you will have time to prepare for that you needn't rush down here right away by express you can come as slow freight and arrive in time to get a good seat the high-grade improvement the houses in the principal thoroughfares here are set down about eight feet below the street level this system has its advantages first it is unique secondly it secures to the citizen a firm dry street in high water whereon to run his errands and do her shopping and thus does away with the expensive and perilous canoe thirdly it makes the first floors shady very shady and this is a great thing in a warm climate fourthly it enables the inquiring stranger to rest his elbows on the second-story window-sill and look in and criticize the bedroom arrangements of the citizens fifthly it benefits the plebeian second-floor boarders at the expense of the bloated aristocracy of the first that is to say it brings the plebeians down to the first floor and degrades the aristocrats to the cellar lastly some persons call it a priceless blessing because children who fall out of second-story windows now cannot break their necks as they formerly did but that this can strictly be regarded in the light of a blessing is of course open to grave argument but joking aside the energy and the enterprise the sacramentans have shown in making this expensive grade improvement and raising their houses up to its level is in every way credible to them 
and is a sufficient refutation of the slander so often leveled at them that they are discouraged by the floods lack confidence in their ability to make their town a success and are without energy a lazy and hopeless population would hardly enter upon such costly experiments as these when there is so much high ground in the state which they could fly to if they chose brief climate paragraph this is the mildest balmiest pleasantest climate one can imagine the evenings are especially delightful neither too warm nor too cold i wonder if it is always so the lullaby of the rain i got more sleep this morning than i needed when i got tired very tired walking around and went to bed in room number one hundred and twenty one orleans hotel about sunrise I asked the clerk to have me called at a quarter past nine o'clock. The request was complied with punctually. As I was about to roll out of bed, I heard it raining. I said to myself, I cannot knock around town in this kind of weather, and so I may as well lie here and enjoy the rain. I am like everybody else in that I love to lie abed and listen to the soothing sound of pattering raindrops and muse upon old times and old scenes of bygone days. While I was a happy, careless schoolboy again, in imagination, I dropped off to sleep. After a while I woke up, still raining. I said to myself, it will stop directly. I will dream again. There is time enough. Just as, in memory, I was caught by my mother clandestinely putting up some quince preserves in a rag to take to my little sweetheart at school, I dropped off to sleep again, to the soft music of the pattering rain. I woke up again after a while. Still raining, I said. This will never do. I shall be so late I shall get nothing done. I could dream no more. I was getting too impatient for that. I lay there and fidgeted for an hour and a half, listening with nervous anxiety to detect the least evidence of a disposition to let up on the part of the rain. But it was of no use. It rained on steadily, just the same. So finally I said, I can't stand this. I will go to the window and see if the clouds are breaking at any rate. I looked up, and the sun was blazing overhead. I looked down, and then I gritted my teeth and said, Oh, damned a damned landlord that would keep a damned fountain in his back yard. After mature and unimpassioned deliberation, I am still of the opinion that that profanity was justifiable under the circumstances. I try to out-sass the landlord and fail. I got downstairs at ten minutes past twelve, and went up to the landlord, who is a large, fine-looking man, with a chest on him which must have made him a most powerful man before it slid down, and said, "'Is breakfast ready?' "'Is breakfast ready?' said he. "'Yes, is breakfast ready?' "'Not quite,' he says, with the utmost urbanity. "'Not quite. You have arisen too early, my son, by a matter of eighteen hours.' as near as I can come at it. Humph, I said to myself, these people go slow up here. It is a wonder to me that they ever get up at all. Ah, well, said I, it don't matter. It don't matter. But, um, perhaps you design to have lunch this week sometime. Yes, he says, I have designed all along to have lunch this week, and by a most happy coincidence you have arrived on the very day. Walk into the dining-room. As I walked forward, I cast a glance of chagrin over my shoulder and observed, Old smarty from Mud Springs, I apprehend. And he murmured, Young lunar caustic from San Francisco, no doubt. Well, let it pass. If I didn't make anything off that old man in the way of sass, I cleaned out his lunch table anyhow. I calculated to get ahead of him some way. And yet I don't know, but the old scallywag came out pretty fair after all, because I only stayed in his hotel twenty-four hours and ate one meal, and he charged me five dollars for it. If I were not just ready to start back to the bay now, I believe I would go and tackle him once more. If I only had a fair chance, that old man is not any smarter than I am. I will risk something that it makes him squirm every time I call him that old man in this letter." People who voted for General Washington don't like to be reminded that they are old. But I like the old man, and I like his hotel, too, barring the damn fountain, I should say. Mr. John Paul's Baggage 
As I was saying, I took lunch and then hurried out to attend to business, that is to say, I hurried out to look after Mr. John Paul's baggage. Mr. John Paul is the San Francisco correspondent of the Sacramento Union, and goes fixed. I was down at the wharf when the antelope was about to leave San Francisco, and Captain Poole came to me and said Mr. Paul was going up with him, and he knew by the way he talked that he was going to travel with a good deal of baggage, and it would be quite a favor if I would go along and help look after a portion of it. The captain then requested Mr. Asa Nudd and Lieutenant Ells and Mr. Bill Stevenson, treasurer of McGuire's Opera House, to keep an eye on portions of Mr. Paul's baggage also. They cheerfully assented, and by and by Mr. Paul made his appearance, and brought his baggage with him, on a couple of drays, and it consisted of nothing in the world but a toy carpet-sack like a woman's reticule, and had a pair of socks and a toothbrush in it. We saw in a moment that all that talk of Mr. Paul's had been merely for effect and that there was really no use in all of us going to Sacramento to look after his baggage, but inasmuch as we had already shipped for the voyage, we concluded to go on. We liked Mr. Paul, and it was a pleasure to us to humor his harmless vanity about his little baggage. Therefore, when he said to the chief mate, "'Will you please to send some men to get that baggage aboard?' we proceeded to superintend the transportation with becoming ceremony. It was as gratifying to us as it was to Mr. Paul himself, when the second mate afterward reported that the boat was down by the head so that she wouldn't steer, and the captain said, "'It's that baggage, I suppose. Move it aft.' We had a very pleasant trip of it to Sacramento, and said nothing to disabuse the passengers' minds when we found that Paul had disseminated the impression that he had three or four tons of baggage aboard. After we landed at Sacramento, there was the infernalist rumbling and thundering of trunks on the main deck for two hours that can be imagined. Finally, a passenger who could not sleep for the jarring and the noise hailed Mr. Bill Stevenson and said he wondered what all the racket was about. Mr. Stevenson said, It'll be over pretty soon now. They've been getting that there John Paul's baggage ashore. I have made this letter so long that I shall have to chop it in two at this point and send you the remainder of it tomorrow. End of section 27